Game of Thrones is an epic fantasy packed with details, and that means some of those details are bound to leave viewers puzzled now and then. Well, you don't need to find the maester to get your answers, because here's a spoiler-filled explanation of the most confusing Game of Thrones moments. It's never really been clear exactly what Bran's powers are as a three-eyed raven. We know he can see events in the past and that he can walk into animals and sometimes people to control them and see current events. In the finale, though, he also seems to imply he can see the future. Will you lead the Seven Kingdoms to the best of your abilities from this day until your last day? Why do you think I came all this way? This isn't the first time, though. Back in Season 7, he gave Littlefinger's Valyrian dagger to Arya, which she needed to kill the Night King. In fact, way back in Season 3, Bran's friend and mentor Jojen Reed explained that green seers like them can in fact see the future. The Raven brings the sight. Seeing things that haven't happened yet. So how much has Bran known about his future and for how long? It's impossible to say, just like everything else to do with Bran. How will we know the end? Game of Thrones was filled with prophecies. From Daenerys seeing the show's ending in a vision, to Cersei having the deaths of her children foretold by a witch. Gold will be their crowns. Gold. Their shrouds. <laughs> and then there was Melisandre's assertion that the resurrected hero, Azor Ahai, would end the Great Darkness with his sword, Lightbringer. That one didn't come true. Or did it? According to law, Azor Ahai forged Lightbringer by stabbing his lover in the heart, just as Jon did with Daenerys. Like Melisandre, we all assumed the prophecy was literal. But if it was just a metaphor, then maybe it did happen after all. The wall was the shield that guarded the realms of men, and then at the end of Season 7, it was destroyed by the Night King's undead dragon, allowing the dead to march into Westeros. And getting a dragon was a lucky break for the Night King too, otherwise he might have been stuck banging his head against that wall forever. That's because the wall was made using ancient magic that prevented White Walkers from crossing it. The wall's not just ice and stone. Ancient spells were carved into its foundations. And while it stands, the dead cannot pass. Only the power of a supernatural creature like the dragon could break those spells and bring the series to its inevitable conclusion. At the summit in the Dragon Pit at King's Landing, the lords and ladies of Westeros do more than just choose a new king in Bran. They also create the Six Kingdoms of Westeros, because Sansa just nopes out. The North will remain an independent kingdom, as it was for thousands of years. So why didn't anyone else do that? Dawn has a long history of semi-autonomy, but given the massive political upheaval there with the murders of two consecutive rulers and their heirs, it makes sense for this random new guy to make alliances where he can. Yara and the Iron Islands, on the other hand, had already negotiated a measure of autonomy with Queen Daenerys. What if everyone starts demanding their independence? She's not demanding, she's asking. So there's no clear reason why she would agree, especially given her enmity toward the Starks. Our guess is that with the Iron Fleet destroyed, House Greyjoy is simply too weak to risk going alone. For now, that is. Seems like Bran is going to have a lot of work ahead of him to keep this coalition together. When Jon was sent to join the Night's Watch at the end of the final episode, even he had to ask one pressing question. I still Night's Watch. With the Night King destroyed, the Wall in ruins, and the Wildlings at peace with the North, there doesn't seem to be any purpose to the Night's Watch. So it's fitting that Jon spends all of five seconds there before heading even further north with Tormund and the Wildlings. What their plans are is unknown, but the way Tormund seems to defer him suggests very strongly that Jon may take his new place among the Free Folk as King Beyond the Wall. Not a bad ending after all. The reunion of Sansa and Arya Stark at Winterfell was one of the most emotional moments of Season 7, but it was quickly replaced by tension between the sisters. For the entire season, the two characters were pitted against each other by Littlefinger. And then, suddenly, in the last episode, Arya and Sansa were best friends again, working together to take him down. Most fans were left to assume that they had done the obvious thing and just asked Bran, the living Wikipedia, what was really going on. The show never spelled it out, though. Or rather, they just never showed it to us. In fact, Isaac Hempstead Wright, who plays Bran, revealed in an interview that they actually did film a scene where Sansa asked Bran for the truth, and he uncovered Littlefinger's treachery. The scene never aired. But if you're wondering how and why the sisters suddenly teamed up, now you know. After Queen Daenerys is slain, her right-hand man Grey Worm demands justice, leading to Jon's exile, and then Grey Worm takes the Unsullied to Narth. If you felt like you missed something here, well, you did. While the show has never actually shown Narth, just four episodes earlier, Grey Worm and his doomed lover, Missande, discuss retiring to the tropical beaches of our homeland. Narth. I'd like to see the beaches again. 
then I will take you there. We're not sure how the islanders will react to being visited by an army of silent eunuchs, but here's hoping Grey Worm somehow finds a happy ending, which would be a Game of Thrones first. Check out one of our newest videos right here! Plus, even more Looper videos about your favorite shows are coming soon. Subscribe to our YouTube channel and hit the bell so you don't miss a single one.